Welcome to season two of This Is Your Life in Silicon Valley, brought to you by the Bold Italic. I'm your host, Sunil Rajaraman, and I'm joined by my co-host, Yasha Kekis-Wolf. On this episode of This Is Your Life in Silicon Valley, we have Antonio Garcia Martinez, who's the New York Times bestselling author of Chaos Monkeys and was an early employee at Facebook. Yeah, not only an early employee at Facebook, but also pretty integral and early in a lot of the technology companies that have created social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook. You know, and he was persona non grata for a while in the Valley immediately after he uh, he wrote the book. But what what's interesting is he's being re-embraced by many people at Facebook because of his his defense in the wake of the scandals. I think one of the things that we learn as adults is that even when you tell the truth and people don't like you for it out of the gate, at the end of the day, they're always going to start to come back to you because they appreciate that that's what you do. And Antonio speaks sometimes a little bit aggressively, but always it seems like what he believes to be the truth. Would you describe him as tactful, Yasha? Uh, no, he's a little rough around the edges. And that's what makes this interview particularly uh, uh, interesting is he, he does not pull any punches. He even gives us a suggestion on who should run San Francisco. Zero punches pulled. Antonio, uh, welcome to This Is Your Life in Silicon Valley, the podcast. Hey, we wanted to start out and ask you, and one, do you live in San Francisco right now? Well, it's a little, <laughs> it's a little complicated. That's a good answer. Where do you live? So I split my time between uh, a sailboat docked in Alameda in East Bay, a off-grid yurt on a remote island in the northwest, and then depending on how the relationship with the partner and mother of my child is, uh, occasionally in San Francisco as well. well. That's fantastic. I want to get into the yurt. Maybe you and I have that in common as kids. You as an adult, me as a kid. Uh, but first, can you tell us about where you grew up? I was raised in the Spanish tile and stucco nightmares of the Miami suburbs in the far western parts of the city, what's known as the Southwest Miami or the Sahuaseda in the local term. Yeah. And and you say that, and for the listeners, you're doing the air quotes. Like, why, why, why do that? I didn't quite realize this until I was older, but Miami is not part of the United States. And I didn't quite realize it until I went to school in the Midwest and realized, oh my, for the past eight, I was a very cosseted little suburban kid that, in fact, I'd grown up in this bizarre speech and cultural community called... 80s and 90s Miami. Yeah. And so there's a lot of local lingo. I don't actually have the accent. There's actually a Miami ac- regional dialect, actually. And anyone who speaks in that can just instantly tell it. To them. My sister has it, actually. So the air quotes are, this is Miami lingo, you know, crack out the Miami dictionary sort of thing. Yeah. That's awesome. And was that experience for you pretty instrumental in choosing to go to school in the Midwest where you said you went? Yeah, I didn't love Miami. I mean, I, you know, Miami now is kind of jet setty and cool, but in the 80s and 90s, it was surprisingly provincial and backwards. And, you know, this is the pre-internet era where if you wanted to read the New York Times, you had to go buy a physical thing, and otherwise you just didn't get it. And it just felt very far away from life. And so, yes, I did want to get away yeah. from it. That didn't drive the choice to Midwest, but it did drive the choice to leave. But yeah, How often do you go back to Miami? As, as rarely as I can. <laughs> uh, usually at this point, it's mostly funerals and family disasters, but yeah. I would have never expected that. Like, I suppose the picture of... See, that's the thing. There's a delta between the tourist experience of Miami is very different than the living there experience, particularly, again, in the Sahuaseda, which is the, the suburban part. Yeah. And so you somehow ended up in San Francisco and in the Bay Area in particular. Connect the dots really briefly yeah. and give, uh, give our listeners who maybe not as familiar with your background with, sure. with your journey. You know, it's funny. I, when I think about it, I realize that I've actually spent most of my life in the Bay Area. I was actually born in California, but my parents moved soon after. I was born in Orange County. My parents moved soon after, so I would have the, the Cuban experience in Miami. But uh, I went to grad school at Berkeley, so I started there in, in the fall of 99 and have effectively lived in the Bay Area with some s- significant gaps for the past 17 or so years. So it was Berkeley and then, you know, investment banking in New York. Then when that blew up, came back, and it's been basically tech since then or journalism around tech. Yeah. And so not just any tech company, but you had a company, a startup that was acquired by a little company that we all know of now. Right. This little thing called Twitter. (laughs) Back when it was 170 employees, I would have been 171 or so. Yeah, that was a little dinky company you would never have heard of. Came out of Y Combinator, which some some listeners have probably heard of. The usual startup, aqua hire, nightmare, co-founder issues, lawsuits, money raising issues. And then somehow, boom, within a year, we somehow get acquired. There's a bit of drama there. I ended up at Facebook and I became an early employee again. No merit on my side, but just total happenstance, became an early employee on Facebook's ads team. And what did you build at Facebook? 
Well, I think the easiest way to explain it, this is a techier than usual audience, I suspect. But the easiest way to explain it is if you go browse the internet or buy stuff in stores and somehow we seem to see ads in Facebook that reflect that, I was part of the team that built that. Retargeting. We Retargeting. That's right. So you've been quoted in the press about maybe not being happy with all the decisions that you had professionally and how they've shown up in the real world or the rest of the world and the implications for it. Do you root it back to this idea of like monetizing everybody's interactions all over the internet? Um it, you know, it's weird. I'm, I'm in a strange situation. I'm on the one hand criticizing Facebook and some of that ecosystem, but on the other hand, given the current tenor of the debate, actually often defending them. Like literally two years ago, I was hiring legal teams to read my memoir to make sure I wouldn't get sued out of existence for it. Just for just to keep the dialogue going in again for the listeners who are unfamiliar, you also wrote a little book. I, yeah, I wrote this memoir called Chaos Monkeys that, that did pretty well and is known at least among, I think, the techie community. I, I've only ever gotten recognized on the street in San Francisco, put it that way. <laughs> so I, I'm like, I'm famous within one block of South Park. That's about it. <laughs> Outside of that, nobody knows who I am. But yeah, I wrote this book called Chaos Monkeys that was more or less the story of my startup adventure. And then those critical two or three years at, at Facebook in which they built much of the monetization machinery they now use. And that much of it's in the news because of Trump and all the rest of it. Are you proud of what you built? So yes, I am actually. And I, I clearly it was the apex of whatever tech career I ever had was what I, I did at Facebook, clearly. Like I will never do anything that surpasses that in terms of impact. Do I often wonder about what it's become in the context of our current political malaise? I do. I don't feel complicit, right? Because it wasn't built for this. I was there during the last presidential election. So I overlapped a little bit with the political ad sales teams. I talked to some of the sales teams and stuff. But frankly, at the time, politics wasn't big enough a, a part of Facebook's revenue to even command that much importance. Like basically, I would say to note everything they requested. Come 2016, I think it's very different. Come in 2020, it's gonna be very different, I think. But at the time, these products were built to sell you a pair of shoes or soap, not Trump and Brexit, right? It was just, it's not something we even imagined. When you think about the societal implications of these platforms that have been built up in large part in the Bay Area, you said you travel quite a bit or you spend a lot of time out of the Bay Area. Do you see the work that you've done and maybe the Bay Area technology community has done impacting people outside of the Bay Area? Oh, hugely. Yeah. I mentioned this in my book, right? Because it's very easy to mock Silicon Valley's change the world ethos until you see it actually change the world. And then it's like... Holy shit. I, it is a podcast. I can say that, right? The FCC yes. won't get it. Oh, definitely. Okay. You're good. Go so Neil might good. beep it out. I'll, I'll mark it explicit lyrics. You're fun. So yeah, I'm an EU citizen. So I thought I'll be a fugitive. So I have to escape the Bay Area in case they sue me. And so actually I started writing the book in Barcelona and Berlin and started checking out a little bit of the startup scene, whatever. I stayed in a series of Airbnbs. So Airbnb has basically destroyed downtown Barcelona as a place to actually live. They accomplished what, you know, an entire Spanish Civil War did manage. In all seriousness, are you saying that to be a, a, like I evocative mean, or is that really, really Well, I mean, real? the buildings are still standing, obviously. But in terms yeah. of, put it this way, I, I lived in a building there in which one of these grand old buildings that was basically falling apart because every room was basically an Airbnb hotel. And you had every day a bunch of loud, rowdy, drunk Swedes and Brits and whatever. I mean, Barcelona has basically become a theme park for tourists, effectively, at least certain parts of it. And you had a few bitter holdouts who would have these sort of really violent opinions on their balcony saying tourists get out. But everyone else basically was, was Airbnb. And so certain parts of Barcelona are, are just one massive Airbnb hotel, effectively. So I, I don't know if you want to call it destroying it, but there isn't the community fabric that I'm sure was there before Airbnb showed up on the scene. So yeah, and, and that's all due to, you know, this office building here on 8th and, you know, Harrison or wherever it is. And yeah, they completely roiled the real estate markets in various parts of the world, launching this thing started by three design guys that went through iCombinator. You know, in your view... Has Facebook done anything wrong? And if if so, what is that that they've done? A little bit. I mean, a lot less than they get a, a criticized for. But yeah, I think they they, sh they should have been quicker to react to the Cambridge Analytica thing. They knew about it for at least two to three years. The company I knew was super aggressive about shutting down that sort of data leakage very quickly, at least on the ad side. I didn't work on the platform side, which is where the data leaked from. I worked on the ad side. But there, Facebook is pretty ruthless about just kicking anybody off their platform that basically messes with them at all. So it surprised me they took them so long. And then just more broadly, why do they keep platform open, right? Like clearly it wasn't a big success as a product. And, you know, there's always a trade-off. Every platform leaks. Our, the app ecosystem on our iPhone, Android, they all leak too. But the trade-off is we get this amazing functionality. Because of Facebook, we weren't getting that functionality. And yet there was a leakage. The lockdown they did recently, which is basically shutting down platform, they should have done years ago, I think. And they didn't do that either. So I, I think they're definitely, you could criticize them for that, I think, yeah. And, you know, based on what you know, uh, has anything really changed within within the company operationally? Are they Are they feeling... 
it's hard to tell from the outside, right? Because most of my friends kind of cashed out and left. But I think one sign that's very significant is that uh, you started getting leaks out of the company, right? The company was a, sort of a cult. And I don't necessarily mean that in a bad way, but people were very mission focused. Ask any tech journalist, they would say that Facebook was the most impenetrable company on the street. You just could not get leaks until this whole Trump election thing started. And people in some sense started rebelling against their management, which I think was a big sign. And so clearly there is some sort of inner moral turmoil going on at Facebook. And I think that that is very notable. And, and there's this any damage that really comes out of this whole brouhaha, I think it's that. It's Facebook losing its mission focus that it historically has had. That, to me, is the biggest damage. In terms of operational, I mean, yeah, there's been a bunch of changes. They locked down platform. They're policing political ads more heavily. They're giving all sorts of opt-outs that didn't exist there before. I mean, yeah, there's big changes going on. I mean, F8 happened a couple days ago, and they announced a lot of them. Yeah, Like dating. Dating, for God's sake. (laughs) Which I think is a great idea, by the way. I I love this. This is great. I think dating on Facebook is going to be so lit. It's going to be amazing. (laughs) (laughs) There's going to be more jealous murders and marriages and weddings and kids that come out of this than anything. It's going to be great. When you think about the Bay Area in general, I think the Facebook story is fascinating, right? It's this kind of cultish vibe, not necessarily in a bad way, all focused on we're going to make things better. We're going to connect the world differently. And the Bay Area has kind of been that way also. Are you seeing similar trends in the circles that you run with in the Bay Area where there's a bit of a break, a leak, so to speak, where the Bay Area people aren't as excited about the Bay Area as they used to be? Hard for me to tell. I mean, it's all like a longitudinal study, right? So like people my age, and I'm like an old fart when it comes to tech, right? Like I'm in my, I guess now, just early 40s, right? I think people my cohort are either like San Francisco because they made enough money they can actually manage to live here with any base level of middle class, you know, sustenance, or a lot of them have, have actually bailed either to Washington like me or Texas or Colorado. Those seems to be like the three states that you retire to after you've given up your life as an SF techie. So I think a lot of people, I don't know if that expresses the deep dissatisfaction, but they just see a hard way forward yeah. living in San Francisco. Do you like San Francisco? No, that's the thing. And, and, I, I, and I know it's sacrilegious to say that. Well, so hold on. There's, there's actually some things I do like about it. I think the nature and the setting is incredible. Everything that San Francisco was close to, I actually very much do like. And I, and I like Southern California too, actually, which I know is semi-heretical to say in San Francisco. It's not anymore. Like, like, no, about a really? year and a half ago, it became okay to say you like LA. Yeah. yeah. I, I like LA actually in many ways. If you can deal with the driving, it's fine. What I don't like about the city, and I think this goes to the core of San Francisco's identity, is that certainly right now and certainly in the past, it's always been this sort of gold mining town, right, of basically opportunists who come and strike it rich or don't and live in this tizzy of whatever it is, mining gold out of computers or out of the hills, and living in this bizarre boom and bust asset bubble lifestyle, and no one really caring about the city, right? Yeah, I mean, the whole business of, you know, the homeless people shooting up. I think Scott Wiener posted a tweet about this report that CBS had of people shooting up in, in, in bar. Random personal thing, might be a little edgy, but my partner, this woman I mentioned, uh, she got mugged recently, a week and a half ago, actually, with oh, my no. kid. Right, right next to Pack Heights, the super high, and not that, like, because you live in a high-end thing, you should be insulated from life, but she doesn't live in some particularly bad neighborhood. And yeah, she got mugged with my two-year-old daughter right there next to like the Kiehl's and, you know, the little yoga pants store and all that little upper class, whatever, boom, right there. And it's just like, does anyone care? And the property, you know, you literally go walking down the street and it's just like feces and needles and broken glass from property crime, right? And it's like, why doesn't anyone do anything about this, right? Like in New York, at some point, someone would lose a job or someone would flip out and do something about it. And San Francisco doesn't happen. I had a, it's not nearly as traumatic as what your partner and your daughter dealt with, but it was like a month ago, my car was broken into and it was a, like they knew exactly what they were doing. I think they saw me open my trunk up and I had my bag hidden in a closed compartment and they smashed the back windows, slid into the back seat, pulled the person out, like took all my stuff. And I called the police department later and they're like, we're not going to do anything about it. If you want to file something online for your insurance, go ahead and do that. And it's a fascinating thing. It's like, does anybody care? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's interesting. We we had two salon employees, one of the editors of Salon, on an earlier show, and I couldn't help but just wonder if Antonia were in the room, how would this dialogue go? But I want to, I just want to reflect a comment that they mentioned during their podcast uh, back to you, and just hear your reaction. They do perceive some problems with tech. I don't think that that's a mischaracterization, and you know, one of them suggested unionizing tech workers. What's your reaction to that? So it's interesting. My politics are very confused right now. Like, I think everybody's probably are to some degree or another. And perhaps more than most people, you know, I was raised in a red state Republican family, right? And here I am in, like, ultra of la la blue state land. And so it's weird to keep a foot in both sides and see both filter bubbles kind of coalesce and fossilize and neither side talk to each other. You know, obviously, the, the subject of unions can be approached from both sides, actually. Historically, I would have said no, because I'm more of a sort of right of center of free market sort of guy. But I think 
If you look at historical income inequality rates, for example, or the rise of working class wages in real terms, or by any metric of like middle class or working class health, the U.S. is doing horrible, right? And it's clear that many people in the United States are not doing well. And so if what it takes to kind of get the pendulum from free market liberalism back to a little bit slightly more collectivism means unions, you know, that's, that may not be such a bad idea. It also, what sort of tech worker do you mean, right? The front end designer who's making 130K cash, 200K in equity, and a bunch of perks, is he going to unionize or does he need to unionize? Maybe not. But the operations person who's filtering beheading porn for 30K a year and not getting an equity, which there's a lot of those people, right? I mean, Facebook hired like 10,000 of those people. They're not living well. They're not making a bunch of money. Should they unionize? Maybe. I mean, they're effectively interchangeable parts in an assembly line, which is how unions started. You work in a factory and you're easy to replace unless you have collective bargaining power. No one's going to respect your rights. That's true for a lot of techies. So while we're at it, solve the housing crisis. And Build more. Fi- Build more. <laughs> you go to Seattle, the sky's full of cranes. You don't see the same thing here. Why not? Yeah. Let's talk about uh, Washington. What made you think about leaving the Bay Area or having part-time in the Bay Area and then going to Washington? Uh, I just like the state. It's an interesting mix of um, a certain traditional Western self-reliant libertarianism that I like in small doses, not huge doses. Relatively nice weather, nice coastline, no state income tax. Uh, what else? Which is another big sell. <laughs> and you, you live up in the islands. Where's the yeah. yurt story come in? Yeah, is yeah. That? So the islands, so in case most people don't know, I didn't know where these places were until I accidentally discovered them. It's called the San Juan Islands. There's an archipelago of 130 islands between Vancouver and Seattle, basically. They were the far reaches of nothing for a long time. And they're kind of slowly becoming kind of the Nantucket for the Seattle area in the sense that like that some wealthy live. It's a bunch of earth hippies too, yeah. mind you. And slightly rural white working class to not say rednecky type component too. It's this weird mix of like techie affluent hippies. Depends on the island you're on. Dep- depends on the island you're on, actually. That's right. The one I'm on is about a third each way, which keeps it interesting. It's funny. Libertarianism works, but only works if like everybody lives on five acres, five to 10 acres, like minimum parcel size. And no one has to live on top of each other. And, you know, it's fairly culturally or ethnically homogeneous. Then it works. <laughs> Anything other than that, it doesn't work at all. But in that situation, it's like socialism. It only works if you're all a bunch of Vikings in the North and the cold killed off everyone who was lazy and moochie, right? And then so socialism works there. And, 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 and similarly, libertarianism <laughs> works in the Northwest when you have like a bunch of, you know, white dudes living on 10 acres who cut their own trees and lay their own roads in and do their own whatever. But anything else, it just will turn into Mad Max, basically, otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of a, a dystopian future, play out the next... 10 to 30 years of San Francisco life for us. Let's just be armchair futurists. Okay. Tell I'm, me what it looks I'm like. I'm willing to do this. I'll, I'll go out on a limb, and I'm sure I'll get criticized for this, but a couple things. So I think San Francisco is a fascinating study because it clearly is a glimpse at the future. All bullshit aside, I think you do live kind of in the future when you live in San Francisco, which I think is why it's so good at developing all this tech. Like, why San Francisco? There's nothing about it you would think. Like, I was in these startup hubs in Europe that are much better equipped to be startup hubs than... San Francisco, and yet it's San Francisco, right? But what does that mean? Well, I mean, accelerating income inequality and housing issues, right? I mean, it's going to basically become a playground for the wealthy. I mean, as I see it, as it is right now, there's like four tiers to the San Francisco experience, right? There's like the inner party of... VCs and founders who have done well, who basically run the show and can actually afford, without any question, you know, nice houses, mansions, condos, et cetera. You've got the outer party of well-paid technicians that run their companies for them. That's what I was at Facebook, right? I was not obviously number one, but you're one of these people who comes along later, does okay, and, and you can live okay. You won't be living high on the hog in the SF, but you'll do okay. But you have to keep on working. You can't stop working. Then you've got sort of the proles who are in the gig economy in some form or another. And certainly when I was in this tech world, I would just order everything on the phone and like people would appear and things would happen. And it's funny when you think about it, because what does that mean, right? It's the whole software eating the world thesis of Andreessen, right? Like back in the day, a computer automation was part of a human workflow. It's the things the humans couldn't do well, like a cashier for a, you know, an accountant or a chainsaw for a, a logger or whatever. But it's becoming that humans are now a stopgap to a computer workflow, right? The things computers can't do well drive a car, pick things off a shelf at Whole Foods, all that stuff, you just fill in humans there. You've got this entire stratum of people that just fill in what the AI can't do on a mobile app yet. That's the only reason they exist as far as the first top two tiers. And then, of course, you've got the criminal and homeless and drug-addicted class, which, of course, the top inner party doesn't even see. The outer party tends to ignore until they get mugged by them, like my girlfriend just did. And then, you know, the proles kind of fear becoming unless they continue in their gig economy and driving their cars, right? And so at least the world I inhabit, everyone seems to be part of this caste system that exists, which by the way, I hate. Part of the reason I went to Washington and live in a yurt is because you don't deal with inequality. You don't think we're at risk of like some sort of populist revolt? 
you know, there's that famous quote by uh, Steinbeck that socialism never took off in the U.S. because the poor don't see themselves as an exploited proletariat. They see themselves as temporarily embarrassed millionaires, right? So as long as everyone who's poor, who gets bankrupted because they don't have health care, can't afford to live within 60 miles of where they work, as long as they kind of keep the dream alive and look at Zuck and say, well, I could be him or my kids could be him if we take the right steps, I think the revolt isn't happening. But if that dream really does die, yeah, why not? You know, when you think about the next 10 to 20 or 30 years, do you believe that there's going to be an uprising here? Or do you think it's just going to be that this is the way that we are? It's these four classes and period, that's it. Yeah, no, in, in San Francisco or California more broadly, that's not where I see the friction points really happening. No, I, I don't imagine a populist revolt. It'd be hard to imagine what you would even rally around. There are no labor unions. The biggest labor revolt in history was in a West Virginia coal mine was hinged around a labor union, and that, that labor union doesn't exist anymore. But but if one gets organized, it'll be through a Facebook group. That, that, I'm to- <laughs> that I totally believe. If it ever happens, it'll be through a Facebook group. A couple of other kind of futurist questions. What companies that exist now do you imagine not existing in the next 10 years that are of some level of stature that people care about at the moment? Other than car and oil companies? That's two of them, at least not in their current form. Uh, Where do you see Facebook in, I don't know, five years? It's a good question. You know, Facebook is interesting. And again, I was a diet in the wool Facebook guy, totally sucked into their whole corporate fascism, like a total, you know, wearing the swag. I was totally committed to the whole thing. And, and to some degree, part of me still is. That said, and I think it's pretty clear to anyone who's watched them, that when it comes to actual innovation, not reacting to things quickly, because they, they've always been able to do that, right? But actually cooking up the new way that we interact with these devices in our pockets, they haven't actually had a great batting record about that. In fact, they've they've been buying innovation rather than building it, obviously in the form of Instagram and WhatsApp, and trying to buy Snapchat to failing because Evan is just as crazy as Zuck is. So I think that's the thing. They're not really building those experiences unless, like I've been peripherally in tech since I guess the early aughts and, you know, virtual reality was always the perpetual technology of the future for the past 20 years. If it's finally the year of VR, then I guess maybe they're there with Oculus. But other than that, I think the only way I see them failing is if they totally miss the boat. Some huge things happen, just like Facebook was to MySpace. And the person who runs that is as kamikaze as Zuck was, then maybe. So you see uh, potential disruption to Facebook coming from other technologies, yeah. as opposed to, let's say, Brussels decides to go hard after Facebook. Oh, maybe God, DC. No. oh, please. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, the European, sorry, this is the bee in my bonnet. I've been screaming on Twitter about the GDPR, which is their data regulation for weeks now. And it just so pisses me off. I think partially because I am European. I have a new passport. So like, I feel qualified. And I've lived there. I've talked to the startups. Like, I feel qualified to say something about them. And so, yeah, no, the Europe thing, are you kidding? That's going to solidify Facebook in Europe even more. Assuming it actually gets enforced, which I'm not convinced it will. And assuming it actually does kill a lot of that direct marketing world, right, that we mentioned earlier at Facebook. Assuming it does, then Facebook and Google are looking pretty. Their media markets will basically tank. Their CPMs, their their actual media costs will go down, which means their own publishers and startups can't monetize. But Facebook and Google will do great. Part of what the Europeans don't understand, and we all and we all do this because we all think we're the center of every world, right? The Europeans think they're way more important, frankly, than they are. <laughs> like I've seen the revenue dashboards. Facebook doesn't actually make that much money in Europe, right? And I don't think it's changed that much in the few years since I've been gone. The reality is Facebook grows, as we saw in their last quarterly earnings report, 40% year on year. That's greater than Europe's contribution to their top line. They grow more in a year than Europe contributes. If Europe thinks they're going to strong arm Facebook into doing anything, they're out of their minds. I, I can almost guarantee you Zuck you know, might lose sleep over some things. He doesn't lose sleep over Brussels. We, uh, we're getting close to the end of our time here. So, And I know you're no stranger to controversies. I want to close out with one I have. And then uh, I know Yasha has the Twitter question, perhaps one more. But if you had to just appoint someone mayor of San Francisco, anyone from inside or outside of the Bay Area who could clean up the city and fix some of its you know, largest existential problems— who would that person be? Oh, God. <laughs> How on a limb do I want to go? Um, I do think San Francisco needs a Giuliani figure. That's what they need. I don't know who that person is because I don't know local politics good enough. But someone who just comes in and basically puts his foot down and starts cleaning things up, I think would not be a terrible idea. I mean, I, I think it'd be totally amazing. I don't know how good it would be for San Francisco, but I'd love just to see that. If somebody like Sam Altman, for example, became mayor of San Francisco, I, I don't know that it would necessarily be good for San Francisco net or good for everybody. I just think it'd be so wild. I'd love it. It'd be like, it'd be like, wow. It'd, it'd be like Trump landing. It'd be like every day it would be like, oh my God, what did he, what did he blow up this time? It'd be amazing, but in a good way, potentially. Right. Um, so I, I think that would be kind of interesting. And when he made noises about running for governor, I was like, wow, that'd be, that'd be amazing if Sam, I, I think the world is Sam, by the way, as I made yeah. clear in my book. So I, I don't mean to at all criticize him, but I, he, he definitely comes from a different world than I think traditional American city politics. You obviously spent some time on social media. You know kind of networks, Facebook, Mm -hmm. Instagram, maybe Twitter. Is there a person or two or an organization or two that you'd recommend to follow right now? It's funny. There's so much great and so much terrible stuff going on on Twitter right now, which is why I can't drop it. Because you go through the muck and the crap to find that one little gem, and you do find it there, actually. 
one broad, I know it sounds a little bit Boy Scoutish, but I think tech journalism has gotten a lot better than it's gotten in the past. Tech journalism used to suck. Those people were idiots, sorry, just to be clear. They're basically glorified PR, and you would sit there and maybe they'd kiss your ass and they'd maintain their access journalism, whatever. But I think outlets like, I mean, obviously Recode, which Kara is obviously an institution, uh, Bloomberg's coverage has been really good recently. Hell, even BuzzFeed actually has like a real reporting team. The interesting thing that I see is that tech, rather than being this weird distraction for like, geeks and like the gadget review and all this crap, it's become central to our lives. Like it has become the thing. I just saw somebody announce that The Atlantic is opening a tech bureau. The Atlantic, for God's sakes. So I think a lot of the tech journalism has actually gotten a lot better. And as much as I sort of bitch and whine occasionally about how wrong they get the Facebook story, they're a lot smarter about it now than they used to be. And I, I assume that trend will continue. So all those things, Bloomberg, BuzzFeed, Recode, I think those are all great outlets. I mean, even the New York Times is a pretty solid tech reporting team these days. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, Antonio, this was great. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us. This will be a great uh, interview for our for our listeners. Hope so. Don't get me fired from the job I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. Okay. Well, I don't know how you feel about that interview, but that was an intense experience going through it. Like maybe I need a drink. He is so quick and just and just fast with the words. And a truth teller. Absolutely. I mean, he's a smart guy with some really, really strong perspectives. So we hope you enjoyed this week's episode. If you liked today's podcast and you like Sunil, like I like Sunil, please go to any of the app stores where you've found our podcast and rate us five stars. We'd appreciate it. 